Pum, 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 pum. Hello and welcome to the second part of my documentation on the Dyatlov case. Let's start with a quick review. In the first part I introduced the members of the group as well as other mysterious cases that occurred in the former Soviet Union. I referred to the measured radioactive radiation, as well as to the strange flying objects, which resemble the silhouette of our seven missiles on the hair. Another point was the reference to the large, bare spots and the reddish discoloration of the surrounding vegetation. I also mentioned the strange light phenomena that do not match the path of the sun and I also went into a little bit about the search teams involved in their photos. As I told you in the first part, we will now take another look at the connection between the photo and the two women in white coats, as well as their strange appearance. According to my research, the woman between the two women in the coats is Zolotaryov's aunt. The photo was most likely taken in the sanatorium, which I already mentioned. I researched for you that the mentioned sanatorium must have been located in Jesentuki with great certainty, as the city is known for its sanatoriums and healing springs. This is actually not surprising to me, since Jesentuki is very close to Pytogorsk and Lermontov. So it is very close to the places where Zolotaryov worked. But it gets even more exciting. Lermontov is known to be a mining town and uranium was mined there as well. Here I have found the place of processing for you, there is still a small lake that is heavily polluted with the radioactive salts from uranium mining. Here you can see the monument dedicated to the Lermontov miners. As you can see, it is clear that the city had something to do with uranium mining. I also found the Wikipedia article about the city of Lermontov for you, which also mentions uranium mining in Soviet times. Even on the city's flag, the reference to an atom is clearly visible. So it doesn't seem so bogus that the women mentioned in white are victims of uranium mining. We're not done with Lermontov yet. As I mentioned, Zolotaryov taught there as a physical education teacher. Here you can see the photo from the first part of the documentation again. The extremely bright lighting is also noticeable here. I found the location of the school for you and was also able to find out when the photo was taken, as a student was wearing a wristwatch. As far as I know, it must have been about 5 past 11 when the photo was taken. Here, too, the angle of incidence of the sun's rays is very noticeable. You will see in a moment why I mentioned this. Here you can see a more modern picture of the school from the outside. I'll show you now where the students had physical education classes. I know I'm more fussy than Sherlock Holmes, but I think this is the only way I can make it clear to you that I see and know more than anyone assumes. Here you can see a map section with the town of Lermontov, we're going to zoom in now so I can better show you the exact location of the gym from the photo. I have drawn the location of the photographer but also the camera angle for you. Then you will see a picture in which I have graphically marked the position of the sun. Let's just switch to the Google 3D view. So that you can understand what I mean even better, I made a montage with the help of Google Earth. The orientation of the camera angle is taken into account, as is the exact position of the sun at 11.05 a.m. Everyone should clearly notice that the exposure is wrong. For this reason, I think we should look west on the map. On closer inspection, it becomes apparent that some things are not right here around the town of Lermontov. Due to the angle of the incident light, I noticed a strange spot about 18 kilometers away from the gym. Although agriculture is practiced here, you can see a small crater, which is now filled with water. The surroundings appear very bare and the recognizable vegetation is very reddish in color. You will also see dead and discolored trees in the pictures and I was even able to discover various ruins. But there are also other places on the map that clearly speak in favor of nuclear testing. As an example, there is a pond filled with water, 
about 20 kilometers away from the school gym, the surroundings of which also look very polluted. I think you can now see what exactly happened there, but enough about Lermontov now. Finally, there are plenty of other things that are very interesting about this story. For example, there is the tension wire, which I also mentioned in the first part. Perhaps you may still remember it. If not, I'll be happy to show you the picture again in which I mentioned this detail. In this picture you can now see the entire apparatus. Of course, one could assume a simple antenna for this cable, since the cable is obviously connected to a radio. However, this is not the case, as a simple antenna would have been oriented vertically as this is the only way to increase the radio range. This combination is much more of a control device. Anyone who has dealt in detail with the subject of V2 or A4 knows that the Germans during World War II already had a directional beam control to direct the flight path of the missile. I suspect that this device was some kind of modification specially designed by Igor Dyatlov to align and trigger the second stage. You can think of this as a kind of radio fence that aimed the missile. Actually, for a historically educated person, the name Dyatlov should bring all the lights to red. You may now be wondering why I am saying this. Quite simply a member of the Dyatlov family was also involved in the Chernobyl reactor accident, and that is by no means delusional. His name was Anatoly Stepanovich Dyatlov and he was the deputy chief engineer of the nuclear power plant at that time. It almost seems as if a large part of the family was involved in nuclear research or secret projects. Many from the western area were amazed why the Russian newspapers kept talking about woodpeckers. But I am happy to explain this to you now. The name Dyatlov means woodpecker in Russian, which is why when they mentioned the Dyatlov group they wrote about woodpeckers. It is as simple as that. So I think there are no more questions about the Dyatlovs now. Now let's take another look at a part of the search team and take a closer look at the cedar tree and its surroundings. When the search party reached the tree, they found the bodies of Yuri Doroshenko and Yuri Kravonichenko about 3 meters from the tree trunk. They noticed that many branches were scattered on the ground as if they had been cut with a knife. It was also noted that the surrounding snow looked completely trampled, which led them to conclude that other people must have been there. This is also supported by the fact that a charred handkerchief was found nearby. It was also alleged that at least one of the Dyatlov group members must have tried to climb the tree because the branches had broken off to a height of about 2 meters. However, I already explained to you in the first part that this was not the case because the thick branches of it were not would have broken off. As we can see from this picture with Igor Dyatlov, the group members were really athletic. You can see that he did not need any branches to climb the tree, which also speaks against the thesis that the branches were broken off by a climber. There are also other photos of broken trees and branches in this area, which clearly exclude the influence of a climber but also that of an avalanche. It was a strong blast with heat that created this image of destruction. As already mentioned this force came down from above. It is also not to be assumed that the group moved outside the tent dressed inadequately. Rather, parts of the group members' clothing are likely to have caught fire, which also coincides with reports from Monsi, who were near the horrible event. These have clearly reported of burning gods in human form, which suggests a terrible death of the group members. There is a lot to suggest that the group was exposed to a hot nuclear pressure wave, which speaks for both the broken bones and the skin burns. But the short-lived radioactivity could also have had an influence on the death of the group members or at least some of them. Now I show you a few pictures of the search team in the original, and in a colored version. It quickly becomes apparent that there are a lot of military personnel among the seekers. The images of the search seem to be rather exaggerated, but also posed. It becomes interesting if we turn to the person Moslenik of Evgeny Polikropovich, since he left a lot of sketches and notes. And here we come to the first sketch. The view here is taken from the Dyatlov Pass heading north. One of the most striking details on it is the cedar tree, which I mentioned earlier. I will now show you the photo of the tree again so that you can see that my statement regarding the bare, not free areas corresponds to the sketch. This is the north-south view sketch. I am now fading in the sketch of the Dyatlov Pass to the east in the upper right corner, so that you can better imagine which view is shown. Now let's zoom in a bit. It is noticeable that five crosses were noted on the card, only three of which were noted with a letter. The letters are a K, an S and a D, which stand for Kolmogorova, Slobodin, and Dyatlov. There are no crosses on the cedar tree, 
which is astonishing since a K for Krivonyshenko and a D for Doroshenko should be drawn there. There is no trace of the rest of the group, which is not surprising, as their bodies were only found later in the creek. It was also Moslenikov who designed the monument to the Dyatlov group. As you can see here, the memorial stone in the Mijlovsky Cemetery is also very reminiscent of Moslenikov's design. Here I notice that the memorial bears a certain resemblance to the American Trinity Memorial, which is no longer astonishing after all the information I have gathered. Here you can see the comparison between the Dyatlov Monument and the Trinity Monument. Another place where a similar monument was erected is on the Dyatlov Pass itself. Here you can see the monument on the big rock in the middle of the pictures. Here you can see another sketch by Moslenikov. I won't go into more detail until a little later. Now I would like to show you some very interesting pictures of the Dyatlov group members on their journey. I'm going to play some music now, and let the pictures speak for themselves.
you saw and understood what I wanted to convey to you with this series of images. Let us now again take a closer look at Moslinikov map sketch, as mentioned earlier. Here you can clearly see the contour lines of the peaks, i.e. both the Colette cycle, peak 835 and peak 880 are marked on it. I have marked them for you with orange arrows. Then I will show you the supply camp circled in red that the group set up before the climb to Colette cycle, followed by the tent that I circled in black. In the blue circle you can see the wind direction that should have prevailed. It was a northwest wind. The aforementioned cedar tree is also marked on the map. I've marked it with a green circle for you. Although the camp was marked with a cross, the river bifurcation was missing in detail. I am assuming that the cross on the lines that can represent the route of ascent should mark the Monsi hunting seat, which I will mark with a yellow circle. And I show you a Monsi tent circled in white. In the red circle I marked the Ospia River. What I found strange was that the word Ospia had at least one spelling mistake. Unfortunately, the course of the river is not recorded very precisely. With the help of the red arrow, I've marked the direction of flow for you. Let's change perspective. Here on the 3D map you can convince yourself again that the sketch landscape features correlate to some extent with the map. For this reason I have marked the distinctive mountain peaks as well as the two rivers Lazva and Ospia. Let's change the direction of gaze again so that we are facing east. Here I have marked the location of the group's tent with a light green triangle. You will soon see that Moslinikov reproduced this point of view quite well in his sketches. On the next two maps I have entered the direction of the pressure wave for you. The pressure wave ran along the Ospia Valley and was ultimately deflected partially by the ascent of the Colat cycle in direction of the group, respectively to the north. I now show you the last pictures, which according to official information were taken by the Dyatlov group. I always show you the original image first, followed by a coloration I made myself.
now I will show you a reference picture from the first American thermonuclear explosion, whereby I first show you the black and white picture followed by a self-made colored version. Although I think that the similarity of the pictures is undeniable. Here you can see the comparison one to one again. You will see that the members of the Dyatlov group weren't the only victims of this nuclear test. There were various planes in the area. On the second last picture of the group I could see nine airplanes, each of which should have been destroyed by the enormous pressure wave. If one of these pilots was still able to land his aircraft, he would have died of radiation shortly afterwards with absolute certainty. Here you can see the direction in which the last known picture of the group was taken. From this position, the bald spot at ground zero, as well as a crash site of one of the planes, are clearly visible. It is entirely possible that Zolotaryov meant that his acquaintance the pilot Gennady Patrashev was killed in the explosion. I mention this because of the sketch on Zolotaryov's arm on which Jenna was written and it is known that Patrashev was called Jenna by his wife, although this could just as well have applied to close friends or acquaintances. Gennady Patrashev, who worked in the 123rd Air Force of small aircraft, often flew to the Dyatlov Pass area, as if being attracted from there. Actually, the 123rd Division was stationed in the port of Yuktis in Sverdlovsk, but Patrashev worked in a division of the unit based in Evedel. He was officially involved in putting out forest fires and planting trees. Gennady told his wife that he saw glowing spheres in the sky near the pass, and then the plane began to tremble and seemed to lose control. The instruments danced like crazy, and his head hurt. He was also involved in the repatriation of some of the Dyatlov group members, after which he began his private investigation. Usually Patrashev flew either an AN-2, a Yak-9 fighter, or a Yak-12 high-wing aircraft. On May 22, 1960, the young family father Gennady Patrashev had a fatal accident with his Yak-12 near Mount Kristoff. However, there is much to suggest that he, like the Dyatlov group, was hit by a tremendous blast caused by a nuclear explosion and crashed in the process. This is also supported by the fact that he was shown to his wife for identification in a locked galvanized coffin. By the way, the members of the Dyatlov group were also buried in a galvanized, or more precisely in a lead coffin. This should come as no surprise, however, as it is common with corpses contaminated with nuclear power. According to official reports, Patrashev allegedly crashed because of alcohol abuse. His wife confirmed that he was said to have flown under the influence of alcohol because he was said to have been drinking with people from the military beforehand. I doubt he was supposed to have exaggerated that much. Since, according to his wife, he otherwise drank practically no alcohol, I suspect that something else was behind it. Incidentally, I went through all the official lists for the Yak-9 aircraft. Unfortunately, I was unable to locate Patrashev's plane. It is noted on these lists that some aircraft were never officially registered and were assigned to secret projects. I even found out that over 70 Yak-12s were in use in the Ural AFL area. Although they were delivered in 1958, many aircraft were only in service until 1961. Perhaps it would be interesting to mention that of the 77 Yak-12 aircraft in the Urals, 19 were officially assigned to the 123rd Detachment. I read on the file about an alcohol abuse crash. In another case, an airplane was said to have gone up in flames because of a cigarette. But I doubt that such a tin box caught fire because of a cigarette. Much more than leather seats were not there, although they start to burn rather badly in contact with a cigarette. Here you can see excerpts from the list which I have studied in detail. I made this that you can see that I have not been idle. I have marked many of the Yak-12 planes assigned to the 123ND detachment in red. You may have noticed that although the planes had a registration number, there were no serial numbers. In my opinion this seems very suspicious. Or what do you think about it?
perhaps it would be worth mentioning that Patrashev had a friend at the KGB who was also said to have been interested in solving the Dyatlov case. His name was Sergei Misharin and he is said to have killed himself by shooting himself in the mouth in the bathroom after Patrashev's death. However, there is supposed to be a hypothesis in which the young KGB officer was urged to commit suicide by his superiors. But, this would be difficult to clearly prove in retrospect without access to the files or an exhumation. Although I would not rule out this hypothesis in principle, since Patricia's wife Gamatina, according to her own statements, would have been almost run over by a motorcycle she is said to have hidden in the forest, as apparently was searched for her. After that, she stopped walking alone and lived in the army camp until she was given a room at the airport in Evedale. Now I am presenting you some clips of a documentary showing an expedition into the area of Mount Kristoff. The aim was to find Patricia's plane. The plane was found about 30 kilometers from the Dyatlov Pass. It is also confirmed that the radiation from the aircraft wreckage was greatly increased in relation to the normal background radiation, and that the wreck is a Yak-12. According to the statements from the documentation, the Yak-12 broke apart in mid-air. A radiation of 300 micro X-rays was measured on one of the aircraft parts and 60 micro X-rays on another. I also wonder why one of the expedition members emptied water over the wreckage with a bottle. Perhaps he wanted to achieve a reduction in radiation levels. An aeronautical engineer and expert is also shown to uniquely identify the aircraft as a Yak-12. But let me play the compilation now. Да, дорогие друзья, похоже, что экспедиционеры отыскали именно самолет. Судя по останкам, он сгорел при падении. Это очень похоже на то, что случилось с Як-12 Геннадия Патрушева в 1961 году. Вот, кстати, очень характерная какая-то деталь, по которой можно определить, что а вот это вот, смотри, видишь, тут узел такой собранный, тяги, вот этот, типа какого-то бачка, что-то крепится, и вот можно определить, что это, это типа, вот, вот, двигатель, да, вот, вот это вот что-то характерное такое. Ровно, делали два, пять, шесть, один, два, пять, шесть, вот так вот. А сейчас в дело вступает радиометр. Его взяли на всякий случай. А ну как радиация отыщется в лесу? Сказывается то, что на одежде дятловцев в 59 году был намерен повышенный радиофон. Откуда взялась радиация на одежде людей, пролежавших два месяца в проточной воде? Тогда следствие на этот вопрос ответить не смогло. Научно-поисковая экспедиция взяла на себя эту функцию. А радиация тут, на месте падения самолета, действительно повышенная. А до перевала Дятлова всего-то 30 километров. 30 стало. 30 километров. Сейчас что-то стало. Почему падать стало? Вот, подожди, подожди. Так я на стоп переключил. Извини, дорогой. По шкале сложно. Казалось бы, что проще узнать, но нет. Оказывается, это проблема. Самолет сгорел давно, номер есть всего на одной детали, запрос на сей счет нужно делать в Москву, и штатским на этот вопрос точно не ответят. Авиация, сами понимаете, повсюду таинственность. Однако Владимир Рыкшин показал все обломки специалисту, эксперту, инженеру Юрию Попову. И тот в качестве очень вероятной версии предположил, что это все-таки куски Яка. Возможно, это от другого самолета Маслобак какого-то маленького, типа Як-12. А это явно фрагмент крыла такого самолета, как либо Ан-2, либо Як-12. As a reference in the sense of the fair use policy, I will now give you a small excerpt from a state educational film about nuclear weapons. A nuclear airburst produces a flash of light and heat which will start fires at a considerable distance instantly, and also a slower moving blast wave. Unless the eye is protected at once, a blaze of light, brighter than the sun, could cause temporary blindness or permanent injury. A nuclear ground burst will produce similar effects. And in addition, a large crater. A mushroom-shaped cloud. 
widespread radioactive fallout. The heat flash will injure the unprotected skin of those exposed to it. Up to 15 miles, your skin will be badly burned. Up to 18 miles, it will be badly blistered. Up to 23 miles, your skin will suffer burns of the sunburn type. Unlike the heat flash, which travels with the speed of light, the blast wave from a nuclear explosion travels more slowly. The blast wave from a five megaton bomb will take 35 seconds to reach you if you were 10 miles away. Here we see a Monsi mark carved into a tree. Then you will see the mentioned Monsi high seat, followed by the mentioned Monsi tent, which I previously showed on the sketch map. According to information, this tent or chum was located about a kilometer away from the tent of the Dyatlov group and the outer shell was apparently blown away by a very strong wind. In the spirit of fair use regulations, I will now show you a short excerpt from a Russian documentary in which indigenous people from the Monsi tribe have their say. Если бы наши были бы причастны к гибели группы Дятлова, так давно, наверное, посадили бы. В советское, в советское время же не церемонились особо с людьми. Может быть, это какая-то нечистая сила, священные места, духи покарали. Либо, может быть, манси покарали. Mm -hmm. Вы считаете, что манси не могли их убить? Нет. Mm -hmm. Я думаю, что, скорее всего, отравились они. Химическое какое-то отравление, понятно от чего, от, от каких-то газов. Может быть, от, э, ракета там пролетела, ступень ракеты упала, и остатки ракетного топлива может как-то подействовали на них. Военные рассекретили это дело, и им невыгодно рассекречивать, видно до сих пор. Палатка порвалась. А я сама по себе думаю, вот ветра, наверное. А что, да. такой сильный ветер, что может палатку порвать? Такие да. бывают здесь ветра такие? Бывают. Here you can see a picture made by Yuri Krivonyshenko. It clearly shows the outline of an R7 missile separating from the second stage. The next picture, which was shot by Rustem Vladimirovich Slobodin, shows the signature of the rocket engine of an R7 rocket, which can be clearly seen in the inserted references. Here you can see a reference image, which I have used in a representation before. Here you can see another photo, which was often associated with the Dyatlov case. I will now prove to you that this recording was definitely taken at the Dyatlov Pass and that it can be correctly integrated into the sequence of the other photos. I now show this photo over a newer photo of the Dyatlov Pass as well as a Google Maps section so that you can see that I am correct with my claim. Then I show you a small montage that I made myself, which should clarify the braking maneuver and the triggering of the second stage, with the help of simple models. This picture also clearly shows that it was taken on the Dyatlov Pass. However, I will prove this to everyone by fading the photo over the Google map. This is followed by a representation of the flight path of the rocket on a map section from above, as well as a montage which was compiled with the colored official photos.
Disclaimer, no explosives were used and no living beings were harmed.